Welcome back to the Dual Access Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Kriebel. In this podcast, I get the opportunity to talk to interesting people in data. And today's guests are the founders of the Data Career Summit and huge contributors to helping everyone make a great career in data. Let me give you a quick intro to them. Brandy Beals is a Tableau ambassador and data analytics manager at Artisan Partners. Over the last 14 years, she's climbed the ranks from measly data analyst all the way up to analytics manager. And Dustin Schimek is also a Tableau ambassador and has been hosting the Data Ideas podcast since 2001. Thanks for joining me. Hey, okay. thanks, Great. Sandy. Glad to be here. The Data Career Summit is designed to help people break into a career in data or, or you know, continue to evolve their career in data. Where did it come from? Two years ago, Dustin and I were both really involved in the data community. We actually met through the local Milwaukee Tableau user group where we're both, we're both based in the Milwaukee area. And at the same time, we were both also just kind of highly engaged. I was speaking at different events. I actually was at, I was on a panel discussion at my alma mater, shout out to Bullet College, um, that kind of really tried to get students talking to professionals in the data space. And they all had the same question, which was, how do I get a job in data? And like, what skills do I need? Mm -hmm. And those are really great questions but also kind of foundational that I thought it's like, there's so many jobs in data. It's like, let's, let's break that down. Let's talk about it. Let's be real about what skills are needed from an entry perspective. And, mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, Dustin had been putting together his like, biannual data jobs report. And so I reached out to him and was like, Hey, do you think that we could work together to answer this question at a broader scale? And we started putting together an idea for an event. And I don't really know if we thought it was going to be something that kind of moved beyond just that singular event, but it went really, really well. There was such a need that we kept doing it. So that's my take, but I'm curious if Dustin has a different perspective. No, for sure. I, 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 his, his perspective is probably like, because Brandy told me to. <laughs> yeah, I mean... To some extent, right? I mean, it's um, so we're both in the Milwaukee community. Um, we've been kind of leaders in the analytics community here through things that we've done. And uh, that's how we met was through the Milwaukee Tableau user group, probably 10, I don't know, mm -hmm. 10 years ago or so, Brandy, at this point. Um, we were both kind of early users of Tableau at companies here in, this, in the city and have moved up, um, you know, into progressive roles. And um, I actually, Andy, I started pulling together this data jobs report that just shows trends on the skill requirements, education mm -hmm. requirements, things like this and data job postings. I started pulling this together when I was an analytics manager at a company here in Milwaukee called Masterlock because this whole analytics field was starting to hit this inflection point where we were starting to create new positions at the company I was at. I was being asked for input on what those position descriptions would look like. Right. At the same time, I'm getting calls in some cases to my desk. You know, I don't know how people are finding me, but they're like, Hey, how how do I get into data and analytics? Like, how do, sometimes these would be colleagues, other times these would be external folks. Like, you know, folks that were like, "Oh, I heard this Dustin was in data." You know, I gotta try and call him and ask him how my son or daughter can get in the field. And I wanted to be a data person. I wanted to have a data driven perspective on what the skills were, what the things were that they needed to be thinking about. It was one thing for me to have my own perspective being a practitioner, but I wanted to marry that up um, with what the data said. So I started building collecting this data, putting it into a report on my own. And then I realized after a while, gosh, this might be helpful to other people like me. And I started publishing it out and it was probably the most popular content I ever, I'd ever intended this, but uh, that I had ever put out and um, it continues to be. But the, from that, we started talking, Brandy and I did, and we thought to Brandy's point, how can we answer some of these questions at a greater scale? And that's really how the Data Career Summit was founded. And I'll also say is a lot of people ask us even still like, now who are your, sometimes we'll go to networking events, Andy, and they'll be like, who are your investors in this, you know, and who's behind this, you know, it kind of gets the serious tone to this discussion, you know, and it's like, uh, the answer is there are none, you know, like, um, this was just a total labor, but if you want to labor give us money. Love, right? <laughs> yeah. Bootstrapped from the beginning, you know, and now it's grown to something that we were, we're pretty surprised by to be, to be honest with you. So, yeah. But yeah. just, it shows you found a market need. I mean, you know, there's, there's clearly, I mean, there's, there's so many jobs out there. I think people get a bit discouraged these days because, you know, you hear of all the layoffs and everything, but if you just do a, a Google search, for example, like Tableau jobs, if you're in London, there's like 5,000 jobs. There's plenty of jobs out there for people. Um, but it, it's, you, you mentioned the report that you write, Dustin, how has that changed over the years? Like what are, what are the biggest things you see that people, the skills that people need now 
versus when you first started and how long ago was it when you first started publishing it? Yeah, great question. I started it in the second half of 2019. And that was okay, when, so about five years, four years. Yeah, about, exactly. Yeah, and then four to five years ago. And that was when we were really at this inflection point where I started to um, go from being kind of just the outcast nerd doing data stuff to like, oh my gosh, like this feels like this is starting to get cool. Like a lot of people <laughs> are actually asking me questions about it rather than me talking about the value of it, you know, and gosh, people actually want to be in these positions. And so you know, how has it changed? I mean, one big thing for sure is I do see like a increasing emphasis in statistics, statistical tools, you know, th anything that that can lead mm -hmm. into predictive modeling and forecasting and, and start to get into, you know, stuff you would need for machine learning, things like that. Right. It's almost like data analytics is start. There's a lot of roles that are kind of hybrid data analytics and data science roles. Right. And my, my report has been focused mostly on the data analytics roles. But it's those skills plus like, a, you know, Python and R and things like that I see creeping in more and more. So what I see is kind of jack of all trade roles that are data analytics title related, if that makes sense. Right. What's the number yeah. one skill people need to have now? So SQL uh, has been kind of the dominant skill for the last several reports. Um, and uh, and then, you know, if I group all the data visualization tools together, data viz is also by far number two. So we have SQL. Yeah. Kind of got to get my number two into the camera here, but SQL, <laughs> getting the data, you know, and then being able to work with it, transform it, get into usable yeah. format, you know, that kind of acquiring the data and then analyzing it, you know, is how I interpret it, D you know, data visualization and then being able to tell a story with it. I see storytelling right. with data emerging as a skill as well, actually. Yeah. 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 It, it feels like SQL's kind of made a comeback. Yes. I don't know. I don't know. It, maybe I'm. Maybe it's just like being shown to me more. But it it feels like it's making, which is which kind of warms my heart because that was one of the first things <laughs> I learned when I got into data, and yeah. I love it because I like structure and it's just you know it's just solving a problem right and it's got step by step process and that's it you know people tend to overcomplicate it but um, yes yeah, so, so Brandy when when you are you're a, um, a hiring manager now. Mm -hmm. What are the what are the skills that you look for in particular? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I it's um it's it's going to be like a kind of a disappointing answer maybe because the short answer is it depends, right? It's it's going to depend so much, but generally, right? I think I'm I'm there's so many skills that are valuable in data. And so I don't expect somebody to have them all. Um, I'm not looking for that unicorn, yeah. um, that mythical creature out there who has all the skills needed. Um, so what I'm really interested in is maybe somebody who has a particular skill that maybe there's a gap on my team and we're kind of, we need somebody with that expertise. Um, so just, or, or just generally a strength in one particular area. Um, at least, and and an ability to learn the other things. So right. there's lots of resources out there, um, lots of free resources out there. So, you know, it's just, it's really about how can you take what you know, fill in the gaps for what you don't know and contribute. So a big thing too is going to be industry experience and domain knowledge. I think that has mm -hmm. made an appearance on Dustin's data jobs report as well. And we talk a lot about it at the Data Career Summit just this ability to help with connecting the dots between the technical skills and having a business impact. Right. So, you know, I think it's really just for me, it, it's probably more about those soft skills, curiosity and being able to um, deliver that, that insight or that communication, especially to non-technical folks. Yeah. And if, if the kind of trend now is to get people to focus in a, in a specific industry, isn't that, kind of bad for them long term because industries go up and down but your technical skills and your communication skills can can cross industries like if if yeah. you're good at communicating and you're good at working with data the industry really shouldn't matter that that is true i mean you know i think all of us could probably succeed in any industry there's no question right those skills are absolutely transferable but to have the business impact really requires that domain knowledge, being able to understand what we mean when we talk about mm -hmm. assets or, you know, sales or whatever sort of internal metric your company is kind of focused on. Knowing what that is and the drivers behind that is going to help you succeed probably more mm -hmm. than somebody who has less industry experience. So uh, 
And, and when I say industry experience, it doesn't need to be niche, right? Finance is huge. Right. Tech is huge. <laughs> Sales is huge. Like healthcare is huge. Education yeah. is like, these are not um, things or industries that are, are fleeting. Yeah. So, but that's if, you my, limit yourself to just, if you limit yourself to just hiring people with, let's say, healthcare experience, Sure. Aren't you kind of doing your team and your company a disservice by doing that? Because you're not getting any fresh ideas outside of healthcare. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that that's the only requirement. Well, I'm just saying, you know, generally that's what we're hearing, right? We're, we're, people want the industry experience, but not, let's say not your team, but generally if, if companies yeah. are, are, are looking for just that domain experience, aren't they kind of shooting themselves in the foot? They certainly can. Right. I mean, I know I like to think about my team as create, like bringing together diverse perspectives. Right. Mm -hmm. When I look at my team, you know, we all can play in all sorts of different areas with different tools that we kind of utilize, but we each have strengths in different areas. And when I'm looking to hire somebody, I'm looking to hire somebody with a strength in an area that we don't already have. Right. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately it, it is a little bit you know, focused on like, what does my team specifically need and what strength am I looking for? And maybe that's industry strength, or maybe that's Tableau strength or SQL strength or, you know, right. strength in Python or something like that. So it, it's, you know, it's going to depend, I think, at, at least that's the way I craft my teams. And I feel strongly that that's a good way to go about it. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I think, you know, being able to open your mind up to people who you know, don't have everything on your wish list, or maybe, maybe if they're strong in all these other areas, but they don't have that industry experience, like that can still be really valuable. I think to your point. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Dustin, how many people attended the conference, the, uh, the, the summit, sorry, the data career summit? Yeah. Great question. Um, so always something that we're kind of surprised by. So we had, uh, over 500 live attendees. Um, Wow. And then we've had uh, 2,900 or plus 2,900 plus watch the recording so far. So wow, um, pr pretty good number. And then and that's just for the last one. So if we at, we've done four now, um, part of the reason why I have a hat on my head, you know, um, that and building analytics programs, I've lost a little hair along the way, you know. But um, uh, live events and building data programs, you know, these these things can have some stress sometimes, but they're super yeah. rewarding. But um, when we yeah. add up the four that we've done. Um, it's a really big number in terms of the number of unique participants that have registered. Um, and you know, when folks register, they don't always watch it. We don't always know exactly who attends and things like that, but, um, we're just super excited about building this big community that we have now yeah. of folks that are interested, you know, and we just started a Slack space, which I think Brandy, um, we started this a couple weeks ago. It has like 750 members. Um, wow. so we can stay in touch with folks in between the events and things like that. So, um, for us, big numbers, Andy, we didn't expect anything. Like this, when we started, we weren't really sure what we would get, to be honest. But to your point, yeah. I think there was, Could a, have been two. you know, there was kind of a vacuum, right, um, for the need that was out there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I noticed in the comments when I was watching that that there's a lot of people, not a lot. There were there were several comments, and I see I get a lot of comments like this on or messages mm -hmm. on on LinkedIn, like, um, "Can you find me a job?" Right. Well, um, Same. Yes. I, I find that like super annoying and like, yeah. I'm not going to do your job for you. Like, you know, I don't even know you. Um, how do you respond? And I tend to just ignore them. Um, but how, how do you, how do you approach, you know, because you all have the data career summit, there's probably a certain expectation, I guess, that you're going to help people, but those are people that just want you to do it for them. Mm -hmm. How do you handle that? Great question. I can I can take it first. And Brandy, I'm curious to hear. I, I don't know that he, I don't know that Brandy and I have ever asked each other this question. So I'm I actually am really genuinely curious to hear what she says. But um, um, it's uh, you know, it's impossible for me to respond um, personally to everyone. Um, yeah. You know, I would say for sure when folks reach out to me with something specific, something they liked that they heard us say, or you know, um, reference just something very directly and then ask a very pointed question. And it's not me doing their work for them. It's something that's like, wow, like that was really nice. That was complimentary. That got my attention. Yeah. And they genuinely need help with one specific thing. Those almost ex for sure. I always respond to, um, um, in terms of the others, you know, I actually, um, I've, I've started to just direct them to our resources for the data career summit. So that's kind of okay. the beauty of now having built all this stuff is I kind of feel like, you know what, 
this was my, going back to our conversation at the beginning, this was my and Brandy's contribution to help answer some of these questions at a greater scale, knowing we could never answer them individually. And so right. I've through some of the auto reply messages and, you know, copy and paste templated messages that I've had, I've found that, okay, I can direct them now and still feel good about this. Like I'm helping, you know, to some of the resources we built. Yeah. You should look into a tool called text blaze. Mm, it allows you to note. do like shortcuts. So if you have like a standard response you want to give, you do like a, forward slash or is it a forward slash? yeah forward slash and then you know i could put forward slash uh reply and it automatically spits out the entire message in like an instant it's really cool, cool. it's a it's a uh it's a chrome uh, extension oh, i nice. use it yeah a lot. i um yeah. dustin knows how much i enjoy you know tools that make my life easier and faster and able to be more efficient <laughs> and yeah i guess the I, I agree with everything dustin said like i think for the most i also don't have time to respond to everybody, but I really want to help. Um, and I think the biggest thing that, you know, I think I don't want to stereotype or necessarily put my assumptions on this person who reached out, but they tend to have be, to be these people that think about quantity over quality of applications. And I think I tried to help reset them and say, it's, you know, mm -hmm. If you've applied to thousands of jobs and you're getting no response, like you need to go back to the drawing board. You need to like, look at your resume. You need to look at, you know, yeah. if you have a cover letter, you know, you need to think like, don't just take all the boot camps and do all of the little, you know, skills and get, you know, just to check a box. Like you need to be now demonstrating that you can apply these things. Um, and I think to Dustin's point, we've created a lot of really great content that now we can like direct them to. So I, yeah, I think it's just a combination of, yeah. Of that One of the message. things that uh, I, I know somebody is probably very underqualified for a job. If in their LinkedIn profile, you know, the kind of tagline or whatever that's underneath your name, if it lists every single possible tool in there, you know, it'll say Tableau, Power BI, SQL, uh, Python, R, you know, and mm -hmm. another 50 tools. Uh, that probably means they don't know anything. They're just trying to hope to get some some traction on their profile. But uh, I don't know. I, I think people should really think about what their message is on LinkedIn on their profile so that people know who they are, right? That doesn't do me any good. Another thing that really annoys me is X Google, X Meta, X Netflix, you know, trying to, you know, uh, say you're a big, that, that you're important. But anyway, I yeah. digress. Yeah. Um, but I think, you know, sometimes I, I just think... get these random thoughts in my head and they just come out in these interviews. No, but I mean, we all have our little kind of pet peeves like that for sure. Um, but yeah, no, I, um, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is just like, what's your value statement, right? Like we all have yeah. a specialty. We all have something Absolutely. that we bring to the table and yep. it's mostly about how do you craft that and speak to it. And, you know, I know Ava gave a great keynote presentation and helped us all, um, you know, kind of understand what that that is. But I think when you know that you can apply your, well, first of all, you don't need every skill, right? So focus right. on the ones that are going to contribute to your area of expertise or your value. Um, make sure that your resume, your LinkedIn profile, those types of things highlight that particular mm -hmm. skill that you bring that will set you apart from other people. Um, yeah. So I, I, I hear you. It's not really about <laughs> collecting. It's not, this is not like that Pokemon game where you're like going out collecting all yeah. of the, you know, all of the exactly. things. Yeah. Yeah. I think finding your niche is important at any career stage. Honestly, I think it works. It's, it's early career stage. It's needed, but mid and, and later career stage needed too. I mean, you know, yeah. the interesting thing is, is I found myself after listening to Ava's keynote, um, you know, and looking at some of the materials that she has, it's, you know, I have thought, gosh, I've done, many different things now in the industry, having been in it, you know, doing data stuff for 11 or 12 years in different capacities and, you know, individual contributor, manager, um, you know, working at, within a company, working on kind of the quote unquote vendor side of things, you know, um, seeing things from different angles. And it's like, okay, now for a different reason, I need to find my niche, you know, um, and yeah, make sure right. I stay focused on that and yeah. not just be too much of a generalist, you know? So I think it's important at all stages and really important. Yeah. I would encourage folks to listen to the keynote um, session yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, they're referring to, uh, Eva Murray, 
who is is my partner, so I'm a bit biased. Uh, but um, if you are interested, she does career coaching in data. So if you're looking for somebody to help you with that, just go to evamary.co.uk. Tell her that you heard it on the Dual Access podcast. And I'll tell her she's supposed to give you some kind of deal. Uh, just tell her that I said she, you get a deal, and let's just see what she says. I won't tell her that I said that, though. Um, That's <laughs> we'll awesome. We'll work, work on our sales skills. Yeah. <laughs> So, so you mentioned, Dustin, it sounds like you would prefer somebody that's more of a specialist than a generalist. I think it, you know, it's like Brandy said, I mean, it, it definitely depends. I mean, I for sure, first and foremost, for sure would focus on who the individual was and their um, right. propensity to learn and, you know, um, just problem solving um, capabilities, uh, intellectual curiosity. I mean, mm -hmm. I would actually probably rather hire someone with almost zero experience, you know, that was like really, really excited and enthusiastic about solving business problems and, you know, right. trying to figure out how to use the skills that they have or learn the skills that they need to solve those problems. Um, I personally would, me personally, I would lean much more in that direction, you know, um, I, I, even though I pull the data jobs report together and I see what the data says, I don't always agree with what the, you know, with what the trends are in there, just me personally. But, um, the one thing on industry experience, the one saving grace I would say there is that, you know, it is listed as a requirement. I'm looking at the data right now, just under 20% of the time, um, in the most recent report, but it's the number one preferred skill. So, you know, there's oftentimes these requirements right. and then there's preferred, right. And, uh, um, so it's definitely, it's, it's important, but I, I'm glad that it's on the preferred side because I, I do, I mean, I would love to have, if I'm hiring someone, I would love to have someone with experience and even within the business that I'm in, you know? Um, but if they don't, it would be just that it would be preferred. I mean, I'm going to go for the person and not even necessarily all the hard skills being checked off. It's more of the person, but that's, that's yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brandy, how do you feel about, so Dustin mentioned, um, uh, required skills versus, um, like industry experience. Are any skills really required for a job? So, you know, a lot, it, a lot of people get discouraged because they see a job yeah. advertisement and it says, you know, these skills are required. And, you know, the facts state that men will typically still apply for those jobs if they don't meet the skills, but women won't. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, what, what do you, what do you kind of think about that? Like, you know, when you put a job advert out for, for uh, somebody you're looking to hire, you put required skills. I think the word required mm -hmm. is, is kind of BS, right? It's they're, they're ultimately yes. nice to haves. Right. Um, yeah. Are, are there any, um, you know, are there any like requirements that you have? So if you think about required skills, what are the most, um, I guess, again, I'm, I'm kind of getting into, is it most important or is it required? <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, it's a really good question. I, I do agree generally that the requirement section really should be loosely interpreted as these are generally what we're looking for, but right. apply anyways, okay? Everybody out there, apply anyways. If you, you don't need all of the things, but, um, but it gives you a sense of what that, company is looking for. Um, to, to answer your question, um, I would say that there's probably specific jobs or roles where specific skills are absolutely a requirement. Mm -hmm. um, for, for example, you know, if you're trying to hire um, a senior data scientist or somebody who, you know, a machine learning engineer, if you don't know Python, or are you're right. you know that's probably going to be a not a good a fit. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, if you're hiring a Tableau server admin and they've never used Tableau before, like that's also going to be a problem. So I just feel like there's right. probably, but, but I will say that that's going to be people that are maybe hang, a little hang bit on more one second. Senior. There's somebody at the door. <laughs> maybe Eva got it. Hang on, I'll be right back. Somebody's there asking for a discount. Yeah. On the career coaching. <laughs> <sighs> What's for dinner tonight, Brandy, in your household? I have, I have this impression that you guys are always like cooking up amazing stuff. Like just. Yeah, I, I tend to cook um, or we tend to like cook most of our own meals. 
Yeah. The exceptions are usually going to be either on Wednesdays when um, my favorite pizza shop comes out with their special for the week. Or Friday. Which one is that? It's Friday. Um, Flower Girl and Flame. They're on like National Avenue, and really, I can they're check like them out. a women-owned, queer-owned like pizza shop, and okay. they do these like cool um, collaborations with other restaurants in the area. And on Wednesdays, they oh. have like a a fun like like special. So this week it's right, Wednesday. corned beef, corned beef on pizza. Naturally. Okay. I'm 100% leaving this in the recording. Yeah. You should. Well, we also, I was like, oh, maybe, maybe that's somebody at the door asking for a discount on Ava's like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. They're just showing up. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I was just going to, I think the, the tail end of what I was just saying is that, you know, those requirements really tend to be probably for more like specialized or senior roles. I yeah. think for entry level roles. Yeah. I mean, I think to Dustin's point, the curiosity is, is more important than knowing the skills. Uh, you know, I yeah. think if you're willing to learn, I can teach you. Um, yeah. but again, that's probably for more entry level stuff. So Correct. yeah. yeah. Do, do you look at where somebody went to school? No, okay. I don't care. Okay, good. That's a good Zero answer. That's, Zero that's one of me. the, yeah. that's what, does it matter if they went to university? No, I don't. I think I don't think so. Not at all. Um, Do they I get think, past your HR people though. Um, are they if, are they being are they being a filter that is is um, yeah. inhibiting you hiring the right people? Yeah, it's a good question that I don't know the answer to. But what I will say is, if I know somebody who's applying, like if you if you've reached out to me and you've made a connection on LinkedIn and you started that connection with like a good introduction, <clears throat> right? Don't immediately ask me for something. And instead you're following my content, you're engaging in the comments, you're like maybe sharing yeah. some of your own lessons and you want to apply for a role. Um, definitely reach out to the person that you know that works there, especially if you don't have, you know, those kind of traditionally expected, you know, things like, um, you know, like a college degree, for example. Um, yeah. You know, uh, you know, I think, in order to circumvent any sort of whether it's like the automated, you know, resume review technology, I don't even know what it's called, um, or you know, a human resources department. Um, if you reach out to somebody like a hiring manager directly, they can usually just make sure that your resume gets looked at. Yeah. Um, but yeah. It, it's really about creating those connections first. You can't just right. connect with somebody and reach out with an ask. Yeah. Why do you look at a resume in the first place? Why do you even look at it at all? Yeah. I mean, oh, that's a good, all sorts of really great questions, Andy. Um, I guess for me, it shows me probably your ability to have attention to detail. Honestly, that's probably my biggest pet peeve is when you have inconsistent formatting in your resume. I'm like, okay, well, if you're having mm -hmm. inconsistent formatting in your resume, you're probably going to have inconsistent formatting on your Tableau dashboard or, you know, right. something like that. Um, so attention to detail is really important. Um, I think being able to communicate and speak in that written form and, and tell me about the things that you've worked on and why you're a fit for this role. To me, that's really what I'm looking for um, right. more so than anything else. So yeah. it's, it's just, it just happened, you know, I, I think that's probably the biggest thing. And if you have I also go check people's LinkedIn profiles. So, yeah. um, and and it's not a requirement if you don't have LinkedIn, that's not a big deal, but that's also a way to showcase your skills and the things that you can do. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, especially I, if you don't have experience. There was a speaker at a prior Data Career Summit. I believe this was Dave Duvarney of Baker Tilly, who was on a hiring manager panel. And he made a good point, um, one that I completely agree with having been a hiring manager myself. Like, and he's someone that I think, Brandy, correct me if I'm wrong, but he's hiring a high volume of analysts or has over the course of his career, he's a senior level person. And, um, uh, you know, he said that he, he gave the example of a candidate that didn't necessarily have every single hard skill checked, but he gave this example of this really clear, clearly explained project that they had done that added immediate value to the organization. They articulated it well, and I think kind of talked about it in terms of how they could do that again. And he was like, I'm like, you're hired right there. Like, right. Cause he's like, so few people come in and, and say anything like that to me, you know? Mm -hmm. So now I don't know if they had 
clearly put it on their resume or talk to it in the interview. You know, you have to get to the interview stage, you know, right. To get the right, job. Right. But, um, I think I always go my eye and I'm more, I've been in more front end roles. Brandy's been, I think her perspective is really good. Like on the, um, you know, back end role side and like, um, just the one thing I agree with everything she said. The one thing I would add is just, um, my eye always goes to, if there's a specific example, measurable results that you got from a project that right. you were a part of, or, you know, bonus points, if you helped ideate it and then lead it to completion, like that's where mm. I feel the same way I'm hands in the air. I'm like, I'm talking to this person for sure, because hardly any, anyone does that, you know? Yeah. How about, you know, one of the things I talked about at, at the event was, uh, you know, showing a progression in your work. Um, do you look for things like that? So, you know, again, one of the recommendations I make is never delete anything from your table of public profile, right? Cause I, as a hiring manager, want to know that you can learn. Right. Um, yeah. I want to, I want to see that over the years, you know, you, you continue to build up those skills. How do you consider something like that in your hiring? Yeah. I'm not sure I've thought about this question before. I, I do remember that in your um, session or your presentation at the summit. And um, I immediately felt bad because I've definitely deleted stuff from my Temple of Public profile. <laughs> um, so I felt shamed in that moment. But um, yeah, I, I think it's obviously really good. I think it, it speaks to that ability to learn, which I think is important. Um, I think you know, and, and you can demonstrate in that in many ways, I think, to your point, how does, you know, what does your first dashboard look like? And what does your latest dashboard look like? Yeah. And are you, you know, getting better? I think that's really great to see. Um, but also, I mean, you could also do the same thing on, I, I don't mean to keep going back to LinkedIn, but it's just such a really great platform yeah. to connect with people and show your work. But, um, you know, too, if you if you are sharing out there, like even just your thoughts, like, okay, this week I'm working on this or like, here's where I'm struggling right now. And like, you can kind of share your journey. I think that story is also really compelling. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's your, however you choose to demonstrate your ability to learn, I think that's important. Okay. What is something that you all, uh, that the two of you disagree on with the career summit? And only one thing though i'm sure there's more than one i don't know if there's more than one <laughs> you, you you give this impression that everything is perfect but it never is yeah right? no 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 for sure it's, it's very hard work. behind the scenes I mean, look at the at yeah. the biggest blow up that you've had around the data career summit no blow ups no blow ups yeah. um definitely no. i mean i would say this i you know in terms of the vision direction the purpose i mean we're pretty much 100 percent aligned and, yeah. and brandy yeah, and i have also really have that. Yeah. There's a Venn diagram in terms of we have strengths and weaknesses, and that's what makes a partnership, you know, work really well, I think, in, yeah. in creating something. I think the Data Career Summit, there's no question. It wouldn't be in existence if we didn't have an overlap in some things. And I think the vision and reason for it is a big part of that. And then differences in skills. I would say that from my perspective, it's it's really just more on the tactical stuff to put on an event, uh, you know. Um, as you know, Andy organized, you know, stuff like this, you know, and just all the stuff that it takes to do that. And then to have that fit into a vision, like these are really hard things. We probably put in Brandy, mm -hmm. how, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of hours of our own time, yeah. um, to this, you know, um, it's more of the tactical stuff, just like making sure like that we get things done. And I mean, of course, you know, maybe we, you know, misunderstood each other in terms of who is going to do what or whatever. There's yeah. those kinds of things. But I, I personally, from a vision standpoint, I think there's a reason we did this with our own time, with our own money. You know, it's because we were very well aligned on the mission. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I would say, so, you know, I don't, I think everything that Dustin said is accurate. I think, you know, when it comes to the bigger picture stuff, I wouldn't say that we're not in alignment but we kind of both come to the table with our own ideas and perspectives. Right. Right. We put it all out there. We talk about it. We, you know, let it kind of mm -hmm. sit and we, we consider the other person's perspective, which I think is really important. We're not just trying to get our way. We're trying to, you know, we each, we know that we each bring value to the table in these different ways. And so talking about that, thinking critically about, okay, you know, where do we want to take this? Um, and it's just kind of like an ongoing open dialogue, I would say. And obviously, right now, you know, we're two people. Um, we we have a finite amount of time. So where do we want to put that time? Um, yeah. 
you know, and, and what are the things that we, we care about that we want to make sure we're, you know, pushing forward and mm -hmm. we're making progress on. And, mm -hmm. um, what was I, the yeah, exercise we did a few days ago, Brandy, just to give people a feel like this was a Sunday afternoon that we were doing this, right? What was the exercise that we did? I forget the name of it. Um, well, it was kind of like a mind map of all That's the right. things mind we map. kind of have going on that we want to have going on. But then we also went through and we talked about our zone of genius and like some of the things that we think we, where we add value both individually, but also, you know, right. as a, as a company, like, you know, why have we been successful and what's our niche and, and what's that value? Um, so we went through this whole thing. And I think that really helps us both contribute to the vision, but also, you know, yeah, it just contributes to that, that conversation about like, okay, you know, again, where do we want to put our effort? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it rarely do we differ in how we, you know, what we decide is the best place for our energy. Yeah. Um, it's just mostly about being, like I said, open-minded um, and, you know, open to different ideas and approaches. And Yeah, I, I think that's probably one of the reasons that Makeover Monday went so well is because Eve and I were so well aligned on it for, you know, the entire time until she would always say, I have an idea, which always meant there was more work for me. So... <laughs> She still says that now. I'm like, I'm not going to listen. But, yeah. Um, so, so, Dustin, how would your employees describe you? Describe me? Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think um, uh, like a mentor for sure. I mean, I think um, dedicated, you know, um, probably don't uh, probably have a hard time following my ideas and everything, you know, all the time and stuff, but uh, probably get probably get stressed by hearing all these ideas that I throw out, you know, but um so I think stressed by some things like that, but I think, um, you know, to me, actually, I, I kind of take, I don't know if it's a different perspective or not on management, but, um, and more so as I speaking more so when I built analytics programs within companies, like, um, when I, when someone reports to me, like to me, that's one of the most important things in the world, honestly. And so like, I, I want to do whatever it takes to make sure that person has the tools to be successful. And I really have poured into a lot of the people that have reported to me. And so I would, I think I'd be pr proud of how they would speak of me. Um, you know, I'm a, and I'm a little bit more of a pushover with the people reporting into me. I think I'm a little bit more, I push the envelope a little bit more to the leaders above me, you know, but I want to yeah. do that just so that we create jobs, we create new initiatives, like we move things forward, you know? So right. um, yeah, I'd summarize it as, I think I would hope that they feel really supported and I would hope more so than the average manager, but I think also probably stressed by some of the, all the ideas that I'm throwing yeah. out. Yeah. Have you ever asked them? Have I ever asked them? Well, I've been through hundreds of hours. Or had some, of it's probably better to have somebody else ask. You know, like you should have Brandy yeah. give her, you know, put her on a on a call with each of your people and ask what they yeah. think of you. Yeah. Well, no, no employees at the moment. I've had I've 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 managed probably that makes it easy then, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. But um, you know, I did do actually one thing that we did was um when I was at Masterlock, we did um this uh, seven habits of highly effective people evaluation. Yeah. Stephen and, um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we went through the whole methodology and we had like a the equivalent of what you would think of as like a 360 review, you know, and um, right. you got the feedback and um, um, it was similar to what I described, you know, hey, right. at some point you got to shut off the ideas and explaining them to us, you know, but um, on the other side of things, like Let extraordinary level of extraordinary level of dedication. Andy, that's why I have a hat on as I'm talking to you right now. I, yeah. I, I yeah. haven't slept too much and I've lost a lot of hair in the process. Yeah. So. How about you, Brandy? Well, I think a lot of what Dustin said resonated um, with me as well. Maybe that's why we work so well you together. Keep saying that. We're not we're not deterred by the other person's like just laundry list of ideas. Um, we're both very creative people, but um, I have asked my team, um, and that's the exact feedback they gave me was, "You have a lot of ideas, and yeah. essentially, sometimes it can take us away from the thing that we're actively working mm. on." Um, so that was really good feedback. So I started document, anytime I have an idea, I put it in a separate list and we review it like, uh, you know, on a less immediate basis. Right, um, right. But, um, but I think aside from that, um, I try to, you know, hire really great people and encourage them to bring their ideas to the table. Um, mm -hmm. Everybody has a unique perspective, value to bring. Even if you're brand new to the firm, I actually probably want that perspective more, you know, right away, because you have fresh eyes, right? There's value in that. 
And yeah. so I really just try to encourage them to bring their own ideas and give them autonomy to, to run with their, you know, their own ideas. Again, assuming it provides value to the firm, that's mm -hmm. the most important um, component of what we're doing. <laughs> but um, I, I hope that they would say the same, that they feel <laughs> supported in that way and that they have the freedom to, to, you know, suggest things and to propose things and to execute on things. Yeah. Yeah. But I've always felt that, you know, as, as a manager, if your people aren't successful, it's not their fault. Right. Uh, you know, yeah, it's your, yeah. And so many managers are just terrible about communicating with their people and, you know, having one-on-ones and, you know, that, that sort of thing. But yeah. So Br Brandy, um, what's one quality of Dustin's that you wish you had? I learn from Dustin all the time. I think Dustin. Oh, you only that one. <laughs> only one. The biggest thing I've learned from Dustin thus far, I'll say that backward looking, <laughs> my answer could be different next week, is his ability to connect everything that we're doing, you know, us with the Data Career Summit or whatever you're doing in your job, in your data job, connecting it to business value. Hmm. He does a phenomenal job making that connection, making whatever we're doing, you know, have an impact, have value, ensuring that, you know, you're not just, you're not just creating some cool machine learning model for no reason or to show your right. skills, but having it deliver value. Hmm. That's really, really hard to do as well, especially in, in, you know, in a, in a data career or as a, you know, like a dashboard developer, for example, how do you measure the impact that something like that has? You know, it's, it's almost right. impossible to measure. It, I mean, it you, is. You know what would happen it if is. you don't have it, but, um, you know, that's, and, and sometimes it's like, well, you can only count that once. It doesn't count next year. It's like, okay, how's that work? But yeah. Dustin, how about how about you? What's what's one quality of of brandies that you wish you had? <laughs> um, yeah, there's 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 a lot, um, but um, for sure, for sure, it is her um, technical skills. I mean, they are. I've I've just been blown away by them since the first time I heard her present uh, ten or more years ago in the Milwaukee community, and. Um, I think, you know, it's, it's, I'm staying within the bounds of one here, but her ability to share those and bring people together around mm -hmm. those to look, to have an appetite to learn more and feel safe learning them. That's something that, um, frankly, no one else in our community has ever been able to do like her. And, um, I think that personally, the city of Milwaukee in our region has benefited <laughs> from her skills and her ability to make it a safe place to learn and bring the community together around her skills that she's learned and um, propagate them. Um, so it's yeah. for sure her technical skills and the community yeah. she's built around them locally. And now I think globally. Yeah. Well, I guess that's the definition of an ambassador, right? And a trailblazer. Completely. Like the, like the hoodie Completely. says. Yeah. <laughs> Completely. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Um, I, I've got one more, um, one more question for each of you. Um, Dustin, you'll go first. We'll, we'll finish with Brandy. Okay. If, uh, if you could no longer work in data, what would you do? What would I do? Yeah. Personally? Yeah. I would own a sports card or sports memorabilia shop. I'm a huge sports fan. I collect sports memorabilia I have since I was a kid. My son and I do it together. And that's a retirement project for me. Yeah. Why, have, why wait? Why wait? It's a great yeah. question. First of all, I don't really plan on retiring, so I just see like everything as a continuation. So you're never going to open like, it then until I die, basically. No, so I can. I feel like Andy, I could do it at any time, honestly. Like whenever the moment's ready, you know, we'll call this my side project. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Brandy, how about you? Um, well, in college, I was an art major in addition to economics, and I would love to have an art studio. I guess, but also I'm really passionate about the environment, so I feel like. I would also love to use my data skills for good and maybe lead a, a you know, sustainably focused organization, nonprofit, something like that. I'm not really sure how those things come together, but that's yeah. But well, you're not allowed to work in data, so you wouldn't be able to use data to. Make oh, it okay, advice. okay. Right. So, okay. Well, if I okay, if I started over, 
and could not take the this is going deep half that I took. <laughs> I would I feel like I'd want to go into like meteorology and like storm chaser. Oh, that sounds cool. Yeah. Is that weird? That's like my I no, love that's super cool. I yeah. Love storm. I love storms. Who's the guy on the Weather Channel that used to always be uh, on in the hurricanes? What was his name? Uh, not Vince. Um, you, you know, I'm talking about the guy. He's got a beard now. But there's the one guy that used to when the Weather Channel first came about, and he was the one that was always the storm chaser, standing in the middle of the hurricanes, like yeah. an idiot. Okay. I, yeah, I don't yeah. know, but anyway, um, yeah. But yeah, I just love. I think like chasing tornadoes would be really cool. I actually the the woman who photographed my wedding, she's also a storm chaser in the off season. And um, yeah, she's my idol. <laughs> yeah. It's only dangerous if you get in the middle of the storm. Yeah. So you, you can chase them, just don't catch them. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's the one thing you like don't want to like, yeah. <laughs> actually catch. Well, yeah. well, thank you very much. I've really, really enjoyed the chat. Um, and if there's ever anything I can do for you, you know how to reach out to me. So, so thanks again. And uh, I will hope, hopefully I see you soon.